Heavenly Father, we ask your blessing. Heavenly Father, we ask that your blessing be with us this day as we study your word. Open our hearts and minds to your will. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, today, begin chapter 7. And did, um, Dave, you want to take that? Yeah. Okay. And the, and the Lord said to Moses, See, I have set you as a God to Pharaoh, and Aaron, your brother, will be your prophet. You it is who will speak all that I charge you, and Aaron, your brother, will speak to Pharaoh, and he will send off the Israelites from his land. And on my part shall harden Pharaoh's heart, that I may multiply my signs and my portents in the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh will not heed you, and I shall set my hand against Egypt, and I shall bring out my battalions, my people, the Israelites, from the land of Egypt with great retributions. I've heard that that retributions has kind of been in the news lately. Yeah. That the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. When I stretch out my hand over Egypt and bring out the Israelites from their midst. All right, let's stop at that point and let's see what we have for um, uh, text notes for that. Uh, okay. I have to, you want me to read the footnotes? No, let's, uh, uh, buddy, why don't you take the footnotes? Okay. Uh, starting with, uh, starting with, okay. Um, I, I have set you, you as a God uh, to Pharaoh. The re reiteration of this bold uh, comparison may have, uh, a, a polemic uh, motivation. Pharaoh imagines himself a god, but I have made you a god to Pharaoh. Um, three, I shall harden Pharaoh's heart that I may multiply the signs and, and my portents. Uh, whatever the theological difficulties, the general aim of God's allowing or here causing, Pharaoh uh, is Pharaoh to persist in his harshness is made clear without Pharaoh's resistance. God would not have the opportunity to deploy his great wonders and so demonstrate his insuperable powers in history and the emptiness of the power attributed to the gods of Egypt. It should be noted that three different verbs are used in the story for the action honor in Pharaoh's heart. Uh, Hiksha, to harden, the verb here, Hezek to toughen, or in other contexts to strengthen, the verb used in earlier passages, and kavit, literally to be a heavy, which in English unfortunately suggests sorrow when linked with the heart. That was a heavy heart. And so has rendered harden in this translation as in verse 14. The force of all three idioms is to be stubborn, unfeeling, and arrogantly inflexible. And there doesn't seem to be much differentiation of meaning among the terms. Though elsewhere, his act linked with heart has a positive meaning to show firm resolve. Uh, shall I continue? Uh, now let's, uh, well, all right, do four again. Uh, okay. I shall bring out my battalions, my people, the Israelites. The opposition expresses a wry and surprising uh, identification. God bears the epithet Lord of battalions, Lord of hosts, Lord of armies. <coughs> Yahweh. Yeah. Says, uh -oh. But here the battalions God calls his own turn out to be the people of Israel. In fact, a mass of wretched slaves who will be fleeing from their taskmasters. All right, let's stop there, but uh, comment on that. Uh, 
Yahweh Sivayoth, um, Lord of Armies or Lord of Battle. Um, comment back to the, let's go back to the um, original writing, the uh, first part of the chapter we read. Uh, can you go back one page in to the first? Hey, you want me to go back? There, that's what I want, right there. No, that's uh, Susan doing that. Oh. And the Lord said, see, I have set uh, you as a God to Pharaoh, and Aaron and the brother will be your prophet. You it is who will speak all I charge you, and Aaron, your brother, will speak to Pharaoh, and he will sell to Israelites. And I, on my part, will harden Pharaoh's heart that I might multiply my signs and my potence in the land. Um, Okay, where are we at? What verse? <laughs> oh, and Moses said. Okay, and Moses and Aaron with him did as the Lord had charged, thus did they do. And Moses and the 80-year-old Aaron, uh, was 80 years old, and Aaron was 83 years old when they spoke to Pharaoh. Okay? So you got to become 80 before you can lead the children of Israel. All right. All right. The right to that, that is surprising to me that Moses was the younger one. Yeah, he was the younger uh, of them. Uh, his uh, sister is uh, the eldest. Six. Um, All right, uh, Dave, why don't you pick that up again at eight, nine, whatever. Okay. And the Lord said to Moses and to Aaron, saying, Should Pharaoh speak to you, saying, Give you a portent, you shall say to Aaron, Take your staff and fling it down before Pharaoh. Let it become a serpent. And Moses and Aaron with him came to Pharaoh, and they did as the Lord had charged. And Aaron flung down his staff before Pharaoh and before his servants, and it became a serpent. And Pharaoh, too, called for the sages and sorcerers, and they, too, the soothsayers of Egypt, did thus with their spells. And each flung down his staff, and they became serpents. And Aaron's staff swallowed the staffs, swall swallowed their staffs. And Pharaoh's heart toughened, and he did not heed them, just as the Lord had spoken. Okay. And the Lord said to Moses, Wait, I, wait, stop. I want to point something out to you. And Pharaoh's heart toughened. Uh... Pharaoh's heart toughened, and he did not heed them, just as the Lord had spoken. It doesn't say here that God toughened his heart. It just said that his heart was toughened. Oftentimes I've heard um, sermons and the like on this, and the statement was that Pharaoh hardened his heart, and then God hardened his heart after that. And if we, if we get into sin and persist in sin, then our heart becomes hardened and then we kind of follow Pharaoh's pattern. I'd make a comment that maybe uh, God wasn't, so, this is almost like God is predicting what the future, what's going to happen. But I think that God is, uh, knows Pharaoh 
really well and he knows how he's going to react to this whole yeah. thing however at the very beginning it said he would toughen his heart and i was just pointing out that he that that god would um will harden his heart and i was just pointing out that, it, that normally what happens for people is that they they sin first and then their sin continues hardens their heart and then after they you know they've had, had several times and then their heart is hardened possibly by God um, as a consequence. And what you're right in what you were saying, Dave, in that uh, it's, not, it's not him foretelling. <clears throat> he already knows. He's not locked in time. He knows how we're going to react. Um, sometimes he changes situations and recreate so that we have more opportunities to turn his way. Okay, let's go back um, to the reading. And the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hard. He refuses to send off the people. Go to Pharaoh in the morning. Mm -hmm. Look, he will be he will be going out to the water. And you shall be poised to meet him on the bank of the Nile. And the staff that turned into a snake shall shall take in and a snake you shall take in your hand. And you shall say to him, The Lord God of the Hebrews sent me to you, saying, Send off my people, that they may worship me in the wilderness. And look. You have not heeded us, us yet. Thus said the Lord. By this shall you know that I am the Lord. Look, I am about to strike with the staff in my hand on the water that is in the, that is in the Nile, and it will turn into blood. And the fish that are in the Nile will die, and the Nile will stink. And the Egyptians will not be able to drink water from the Nile. And the Lord said to Moses, say to Aaron, take your staff and stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt, over their rivers and over their Nile channels and over their ponds and all over all the gathering of the water that they become blood. And there will be blood in all the land of Egypt and in the trees and in the stones and Moses and Aaron did this as the Lord had charged. And he raised the staff and struck the water that was in the Nile before the eyes of Pharaoh and the eyes of his servants. And all the water that was in the Nile turned to blood. And the fish were in the Nile. Didn't I read this? I guess no. not. They're just repeating it. And the fish that were in the Nile died, and the Nile stunk. And the Egyptians could not drink water from the Nile. And the blood was in the land of Egypt. And the soothsayers of Egypt did thus with their spells. And Pharaoh's heart toughened, and he did not heed them, just as the Lord had spoken. And Pharaoh turned and came into the house, and this, too, he did not take to heart. And all of them <clears throat> dug around the Nile for water to drink, for they could not drink the water of the Nile. And seven full days passed before the Lord struck the Nile. And the Lord said to Moses, Come to Pharaoh, and you shall say to him thus, said the Lord, Send off my people that they may worship me. And if you refuse to send them off, look, I'm about to scourge, scourge all your region with frogs. And the Nile will, will swarm with frogs, and they will come up and, and come into your house and into your bedchamber and onto your couch and into your servant's house and upon your people and into your ovens and into your kneading pans, and upon you, and upon your people, and upon all your slaves, the frogs will come up. 
Do you want to go to the footnote? Uh, yes, let's go ahead. You just reminded me of a of something, but we'll do the footnotes first. Well, if they had a run on frog legs, <laughs> they'd probably be in the right place. Yeah, and the rest of it too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, where are we at? Now, okay, let it become a serpent. The noun used here, tannin, is not the ordinary Nash snake of a burning bush story, of the burning bush story. When God in verse 15 refers to the staff that turned it into a snake, Nash, Nash, he may be alluding to the burning bush episode. The tannin is usually a large, larger threatening reptile, as William Prop correctly observes, and is sometimes used for the Egyptian crocodile. Or for the, you know, this is leading nowhere. Or for the, the mythological dragon. The Hebrew zoological reference is clearly slippery, <clears throat> allowing a couple of commentators to see a, a nilectic co cobra in the transformation transformed shepherd's staff. And they too, the soothsayers of Egypt, did thus with their spells. The Hebrew word for soothsayers, artumenon, is a direct borrowing from the Egyptian designation for priests, music, ma magicians. The term translated as spells, uh, lehitam, either is related to the root that means to conceal, or if one follows a proposal of Abraham, Ezra is derived from the root, I-H-T, to flame out, which he links with the fire and the flash technique of the illusionist, uh, Ezra, a, a rationalist. Thus implies that the soothsayer's success in transforming their staffs into serpents was an act of uh, legger, legger domain. The ancient writer, however, seems to have assumed the efficiency of magic as a kind of technology. The point of the story is that the capacity of this technology was limited, and hence the Authenticity. A miraculous serpent into which Aaron's staff has turned swallows up to others, the other serpents. Yeah. So just a comment here. The, so Aaron's staff was actually turned into a serpent, but the the soothsayers, the magicians, were probably some kind of illusion. Does that sound right? Well, yeah, more like uh, if you consider it, um, the soothsayers somehow had their their staffs were actually snakes, uh, oh. and uh, in a, uh, somehow I don't know, hypnotic or whatever uh, situation that they. They look like staffs with, you know, snake head, whatever. When they threw them down, it it, it changed. Um, but the the real point is that Aaron's staff swallowed them up like they were nothing. Okay. Barrel's heart. What well, I was thinking when he when he was talking about that uh, that route for a, a flame or flame out uh, or smoke. Uh, what came to my mind was <laughs> the legendary smoke and mirrors trick, right? So you've got the smoke and mirrors trick going on, but what Aaron is doing, of course, is not a smoke and mirrors trick. So right. you can you can you can put you can substitute those your own serpents down there, but uh, that really you know didn't impress um, you know Aaron's serpent any too much, and they were eaten up. 
Right. And if, and if you think about the uh, when it's portrayed in uh, magic arts and the like, uh, if you have uh, smoke and mirrors, if you're talking about it, uh, it's uh, sometimes gunpowder and that kind of thing. So you kind of picture the what was going on there. Uh, it's used to grab somebody's attention while something else is going on. Sure. Um, just go ahead with the, the reading then, Pharaoh's. Okay. Pharaoh's heart toughened. In any case, Pharaoh is not impressed. Moses and Aaron, after all, have done no more than then trump his sorcerers at their own game. What is called for in the order to shake him is a series of truly cataclysmic, miraculous events. Look, he will be going out to the water. This narrative presupposes, at least on the information about Egypt available to the Hebrew writers, that Egyptian royalty regularly went down to the Nile to bathe. Unless the purpose was, as Ezra proposes, to check the level of the Nile. Pharaoh's encounter with Moses by the riverside looks back to the discovery of Moses by Pharaoh's daughter when she went down to the Nile. When she found the babe, baby. Okay. That, that. That's just pulling the connection of the two together. Okay. Uh, send off my people that they may worship me. You have not heeded. It should be observed that this prose narrative, in a style not evident in most other biblical stories, proceeds through the solemn, emphatic reiter reiteration of refrain-like phrases and entire clauses, both in the language of the narrator and in the dialogue. <clears throat> Water and blood. For Egypt is a nation de dependent on irrigation, the Nile with its fresh water is literally a lifeline. Blood in the Bible is imagined in radically ambiguous terms. The source and substance of life, an atropaic and redemptive agent, the token of violence and death. It is manifestly the third of these meanings that is brought into play here. As the first plague symbolically anticipates the last one and deprives Egypt of life-sustaining water. Nile channels. The Hebrew here convert, converts the Egyptian loan word, yeor, Nile, into a plural. Elsewhere, in occasional poetic usage, this plural form is simply an elegant synonym for streams or rivers. In this Egyptian context, it seems more likely that it, de it designates both the Nile itself and the system of irrigation canals built out from the Nile. In the trees and the stones, many construe this as a reference to wooden and stone vessels or receptacles, but the plural form, a sem, a sem suggests trees rather than wood. In any case, trees and stones as object in nature according, accord better with the catalog of bodies of water that proceeds than would household utensils. It, is, it has also been noted that the Hebrew pairing here, et sim, uh, avenum, is often used to refer to the material out of which idols are made. He raised his staff. This would have to be Aaron before the eyes of Pharaoh and the eyes of his servants. The first spectacular uh, cataclysm is devised so that they will be eyewitnesses to the fearful event. In most of these contexts, servants 
It can also mean slaves, refers to Pharaoh's uh, courtiers. And the Egyptian would not, could not drink water from the Nile. Did it turn the, the water that they had in their little vessels, like if they had a, a cup of water or something, that that turned to blood too? Probably did, didn't it? I, uh, with him raising the staff over and what they were talking about, the utensils and the like, wooden, stone, whatever, possibly. Um, they're going to have to get water from somewhere. So if they, they're digging and going for groundwater is what it sounded like in the reading. One of the most frequently employed conventions of biblical narrative is the verbatim repetition of whole clauses or even sequences of clauses of narrative material. Often as here, once in dialogue and once in the narrator's report, but the characteristic characteristic handling of this convention is to introduce a small but quite revelatory, uh, revelatory, revelatory divergence from verbatim replication as the material is treated, repeated. See the comments on the elab elaborate uh, near verbatim repetitions in Genesis 24 as a textbook illustration of this technique. Here, however, the point of repetition seems to be that every term of God's dire prediction in verse 18 is implemented as an accomplished event. Only the temporal aspects of the verbs shifting with one minor substitution of a synonym instead of will not be able, could not, the summary clause at the end of the verse here, and the blood was all the land of Egypt, is not part of the prediction in verse 18, but appears to be a digest of the pan panorama of sights to be struck in God's, in in God's instructions for Aaron in verse 19. Okay. Remember when you were reading that initially, you said, didn't I read this before? Yeah. That's what they're talking about. So the the that, rep that repetition there. The, yeah, was one, one was what was supposed to take place, and the other is what did take place. It was practically word for word. Yes. Okay. Okay, 22. The soothsayers of Egypt did, did thus with their spells. Ezra wanders where they got the water to turn into blood if Moses and Aaron had already done the trick for the Nile and all the rivers and ponds. So that kind of was my question. Well, they... His answer is that they performed their magic on water dug up from subterranean sources. A conjurer's act of transmutation that is not to be compared with the miraculous conversion of streams of flowing water into blood. Again, the reality of a technology of magic is not called into question, but it is noteworthy that the soothsayers can do no more than affect a pale imitation of the destructive act of the God of the Hebrews. What they are, pow are powerless to do is to reverse the process of destruction. Yeah, I'm going to say that's really what <laughs> would have made the difference. And they can do that. All right. And seven full days passed, the literal sense of the Hebrew is, and seven days were filled. Many commentators infer that during this period, the waters of the Nile returned to their original state. Otherwise, the first plague alone would have been sufficient to make things utterly intolerable for Pharaoh. Although the King James Version begins chapter 8 at this point, the Masoretic text continues chapter 7 for four more verses as here. Okay, I'll pass it off to another reader. All right. 
Um, you know, that seven days that they were talking about, well, um, it said that they, they did get groundwater, you know, by digging. Uh, so, I the number know. seven is a, is a common number in the Bible, biblical. Yep. So, so seven is normally derived around God's number. So, seven, 12. Yeah. yeah. 12 is completeness. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, so we had blood. The water was turned into blood. And now we move to the next. Uh, are we reading footnotes or are we reading the verses right now? We're reading yeah. footnotes. All right, let's go back to the verses. We've read the verses. We read the verses around. Did we, did we go through? Oh, we did the frogs too. Yeah. Okay, let's finish that then. The now will swarm with frogs. The verb in the Hebrew is transitive, will swarm frogs. Several commentators have noticed that this word choice echoes the swarming of the proliferating Hebrew in chapter one. There, the orgy of propagation seems to have struck the Egyptians as repellently reptilian. Here they are assaulted with a nauseating plague of amphibians. In this, as in other details of the plague's narrative, the allusions to the creation story initially sounded in the first chapter of Exodus, turned into a network of reversals of the original creation. It would be excessive to insist that every detail of the narrative, or even every plague, confirms this pattern. Nevertheless, the allusions to early Genesis or, that are detectable trace a possibility that much exercised the imaginations of the biblical writer. If creation emerged at a particular moment in a process with discriminated stages, one could imagine an undoing of this event and this process. Apocalypse being the other side of the coin of creation. The benign swarming of life in Genesis turns into a threatening swarm of odious creatures, just as the penultimate plague of darkness, prelude to mass death, is a reversal of the first let there be light. Alexander Pope, at the end of his great anti-creation poem, The Dunciad, writes thoroughly in the spirit of these reversals when he announces of the new reign of anarchy. Light dies before thy uncreating word. Into your house, your bedchamber, your couch, your servants' houses, the all-powerful Pharaoh should be invulnerable to such violation and should be able to protect his people. Instead, what this fearful catalog of penetrations conveys is the absolute helpless exposure of all Egypt, from king to slave, from the intimate place of sleep and procreation to the places where food is prepared in the face of God's onslaught. Upon you, the Hebrew preposition would normally mean into you, which led the Talmud Sanhedrin 80 to amplify the idea of grotesque penetration by saying that the frogs would croak from inside the guts of the Egyptians. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> a li little story for you here. Um, when I was, I don't know, about 12, 13, 14, somewhere right in there, um, I was our family was invited to go up with my aunt and uncle to uh, Lake Arrowhead and Gregory, where they camped at Club Samaritz. And uh, my cousin Donna and I went out one day. The fish weren't biting so well, so we started catching frogs. And we caught, oh, we, we had a, cup, uh, a plate, a paper plate. And we filled it and stacked it tall. We were going to have frog legs. That's what kids think. 
Anyhow, that's like uh, when Dave said, you know, frog legs. Anyway, we put another paper plate on top of it and we took it back to the cabin. But my aunt and grandmother were not there. So what are you going to do with them? We put them in the refrigerator. <laughs> then we went back down to the lake to swim. And uh, they came home and I opened up the refrigerator. And 40 frogs went 40 different directions. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Uh, so whenever we can talk about the frogs, they were all over the place. And you know, my aunt and grandmother were not happy at all with that situation. <laughs> we had to take them all in, take them back down and put them in the, the lake. <laughs> but, you know, so frogs in your life. Uh, yeah, I had a, we used to go out there catch frogs when I lived up in Tacoma and I brought them home one time and put them in the basement because uh, our basement was a dugout basement and would fill up with water in the in the winter time there in, in Tacoma and it's kind of like the same thing so we had all these frogs in our basement and dad wasn't happy about that either <laughs> uh, okay but can you imagine I mean, I mean picture in mind what was going on in Egypt with frogs everywhere, and they were just, you know, uh, what a mess. That was kind of a strange uh, choice uh, for for uh, reptiles. Actually, a frog is an amphibian, isn't it? Yeah, it's an amphibian, but it's, you know, it, it grows uh, to... They don't need water or they don't need water for extended periods. Um, well, those bullfrogs are huge. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, and we have no idea how big they were. <laughs> the book doesn't tell us. Okay, so any comments before we move on for the frogs? It seems like uh, uh, Moses and Aaron, they're in a competition with the soothsayers. Any, anything native the soothsayers can equal. At some point, it has to uh, change. Well, it, and it will. Uh, human capabilities are... are uh, are limited. But don't forget when we were created, we were created in the image of God. Part of that is our creativity, which for the, the soothsayer is just just that, being creative in how they're doing things. It's a trick. Well, these soothsayers are kind of uh, part of the court of the Pharaoh. Yeah, they're they're also the what um, advisors to the pharaoh in that respect too. But they get that that position by their hidden arts, if you want to call them that, almost trickery. Yeah. So I've had a really weird thought. <laughs> When he calls it technology, the magic technology, all of a sudden it hit me that we're living in the very same place. If we look at technology as man's creative ability to imitate God, then look at look the technology around con, yeah, conception or well, art. A Take a look at the, the what what uh, God said when He came down um, and confused the languages. See so if they leave them the way they are, they'll be able to do anything. That's because He made man so well. No, but our you know we look at today and society. 
aren't we letting technology replace God in our minds? I oh, mean, well, I don't you know. That's true. Um, but I don't know if it's so much replacing him in our minds as replacing him in our hearts as we rely on other things in him. Right, right. And if, if our technology is able to bring us a uh, certain amount of uh, uh, assurance, if you would, um, it also uh, has put uh, all of uh, mankind at the very brink of destruction. So, you know, you're in, in a very tight balance. Um, well, and but that's where we're putting our trust now, right? Yeah, well, see, you know, that's, what is your God? Right. What you fear the most and what you love the most. Or what you're trusting. All right. But what you trust in and what somebody else trusts in are not necessarily the same thing. And yeah, that is a substitu uh, substitution for God. For other people, it may be power or it may be money or maybe both. And the struggle to obtain more for that. Well, these endless wars going on all the time. Uh, I'm thinking the, the uh, frogs coming out of the Nile. Um, it's an interesting what's coming. Uh, one leads to the next, to the next, as far as the plague is concerned, as I see it. So you're going to have a bunch of dead frogs here before long, and then you're going to have a bunch of flies. And, uh, that really makes a lot of sense. Well, it could have been crocodiles. So. Well, yeah, it could have been crocodiles, and they've been snapping after your bottom, huh? No, that would that would have not been good. <laughs> yeah. No, I've seen Nile crocodiles when I was there. I I didn't see any frogs, but I saw the crocodiles, and you don't want to tangle with them. Uh. -uh. The big ones. Oh yeah. Well, uh, down in Florida, I tell you, not even the little, not even the little alligators, because they can run faster than you can. Sorry, I didn't mean to take us off track. It just, <laughs> I'd never thought of that before. But for me, that was a connection to, yeah, you know, where we're at today in terms of the, the word technology. I never occurred to me before. Well, that technology was taken in in the reference to the the magicians, wasn't yep. it? Yep. Which is the, the force that uh, is opposing God at this point, right? So. All right, let's go back to our, our text then. Okay. Diane, you want to take that? And the Lord said to Moses, say to Aaron, stretch out your hand with your staff over the rivers, over the Nile channels, over the Nile channels and over the ponds and bring up the frogs over the land of Egypt. And Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. And the soothsayers did thus with their spells and brought up frogs over the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh called to Moses and to Aaron and said, Entreat the Lord that he take away the frogs from me and from my people, and I shall send off the people, that they may sacrifice to the Lord. And Moses said to Pharaoh, You may vaunt over me as far when I should entreat for you and for your servants and for your people to cut off the frogs from you and from your houses. Only in the Nile will they remain. And he said, For tomorrow. And he said, as you have spoken so that you may know there is none like the Lord our God. And the frogs will turn away from you and from your houses and from your servants and from your people. Only in the Nile will they remain. And Moses and Aaron with him went out from the Pharaoh's presence. And Moses cried out to the Lord concerning the frogs that he had put upon Pharaoh. And the Lord did according to Moses' words. And the frogs died out of the houses and out of the courtyards and out of the fields. 
and they piled them up, heap upon heap, and the land stank. And Pharaoh saw that there was relief, and he hardened his heart and did not heed them, just as the Lord had spoken. And the Lord said to Moses, say to Aaron, stretch out your staff and strike the dust of the land, and there will be lice in all the land of Egypt. And thus they did. And Aaron stretched out his hand with his staff and struck the dust of the land, and there were lice in men and in beasts. All the dust of the land became lice in all the land of Egypt. And thus the soothsayers of Egypt did with their spells to take out the lice, but they were unable. And the lice were in men and in beasts. And the soothsayers said to Pharaoh, God's finger it is. And Pharaoh's heart toughened, and he did not heed them, just as the Lord had spoken. And the Lord said to Moses, rise early in the morning and station yourself before Pharaoh. Look, he will be going out to the water. And say to him, thus said the Lord, send off my people that they may worship me. For if you do not send off my people, I am about to send against you and against your servants and against your people and against your houses, the horde. And the houses of Egypt will be filled with the horde and the soil too on which they stand. But I shall set apart on that day the land of Goshen upon which my people stand so that no horde will be there, that you may know that I am the Lord in the midst of the land. And I shall set a ransom between my people and your people. Tomorrow this sign will be. And thus the Lord did. And the heavy horde came into the house of Pharaoh and the house of his servants. And in all the land of Egypt, the land was ravaged in the face of the horde. And Pharaoh called to Moses and to Aaron and said, go sacrifice to your God in the land. And Moses said, it is not right to do thus for the abomination of Egypt we shall sacrifice to the Lord our God. If we sacrifice the abomination of Egypt before their eyes, will they not stone us? A three days journey into the wilderness we shall go, and we shall sacrifice to the Lord our God as he said to us. And Pharaoh said, I myself will send you off that you may sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness. Only you must not go far away. Entreat on my behalf. And Moses said, look, I am going out from your presence and I shall entreat the Lord that the horde may turn away from Pharaoh and from his servants and from his people tomorrow. Only let not Pharaoh continue to mock by not sending the people off to sacrifice to the Lord. And Moses went out from Pharaoh's presence and entreated the Lord. And the Lord did according to Moses' words. And the horde turned away from Pharaoh and from his servants and from his people. Not one remained. And Pharaoh hardened his heart this time too. And he did not send off the people. Okay. Yeah, he called it a horde. Yeah, what is it? A horde of what? <laughs> well, I understood it to be flies. Flies, okay. Uh... I don't know. It's, the definition of a horde is a bunch, <laughs> a, a lot of people. Yeah. yeah, a large group. Yeah, but it doesn't say a horde of what. Yeah, and uh, if we get it, to the it's biblical. always been in in uh, English translations, it's been uh, flies. Buddy, you got anything there? No, okay. no. I, I, I just it's interesting that you know he was uh, Pharaoh was. Uh, you know, asking them to make a sacrifice or uh, conduct um, um, a, a kind of service on behalf of the Egyptian people. And, uh, but, you know, they needed to, to go off a ways to do that. And, uh, you know, it's kind of like, well, how far away am I going to allow these people to do it? And then before the, the whole, uh, you know, prayer service or whatever was canceled altogether, it's, Kind of an interesting dynamic that I, you know, hadn't noticed on my, you know, whatever perusal of Exodus I've ever had. Uh, but that's kind of an interesting dynamic there. Yeah. And 
this is going to be the same thing in the end. We know that. No, knowing the story, Pharaoh's going to go <laughs> after him. Um, yeah. Well, can I? Can we go? Can we go off three days distance to do the service? Can we go off six days distance? Can we go off a week's distance? And and uh, I think Pharaoh kind of, uh, you know, believes that he's being uh, being hustled here, you know, and uh, reneges on the whole deal. Yeah. Well, it will cost him later. Um, Time-wise, we're just about out. Uh, the, the horde could be a swarm, so that definitely would fall in line with the flies. Yeah. Yeah, a swarm might be a better translation for that purpose. Well, did uh, <laughs> I'm mixing up stories here. Where, where did the, the locusts come in? They come in later. Oh, we haven't got there yet. No, we haven't got there yet. Oh, okay. All right. Things get worse. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they only go downhill in that respect. All right. Um, well, blessings on your day. We will have our worship tonight at uh, 7. Um, let's pray heavenly father we ask your blessing upon our day and our on our worship life we ask you lord to continue to strengthen us in faith and in love may we see that your will is the will to do we pray this in jesus name amen